I'm here today visiting Steph in Wellington, being blown by the infamous wind of the region. And not only is Wellington famous for its wind, it's also very well known for its numerous earthquakes. And in the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake, Wellington shook a little bit. I'm stood here right now on the south coast with the Cook Strait behind me. And in the distance, we've got the beautiful snow-capped peaks of the Kaikoura Ranges, close to where the earthquake happened itself. Okay, so we're in New Zealand, so the southern hemisphere of planet Earth, you know, a little bit east of Australia, and on the east coast of New Zealand, there's something called a subduction zone, and this is where one tectonic plate sinks beneath the other. And we call this one the Hikarangi subduction margin, and there are several others around the world, all of different names, but generally you get one plate going beneath the other and they cause really big earthquakes. So in November 2016, off a place called Kaikoura that you may have heard of potentially because it's got whales and it's a really cool place to go whale watching. There was a really big earthquake um, known as a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. And what that means is, it got really, really shaky for quite a period of time. And a whole bunch of the upper part of the tectonic plate there broke in a series of faults. So the 2016 earthquake was a really big event. It's one of the most studied earthquakes on Earth. So the intense shaking lasted for about 90 seconds or so. And in that time, mountains started to fall down, the coast uplifted, lifting up seaweed and seals and crabs and things. The land got destroyed in places, so some of the roads got taken out, some of the railways got sort of twisted, and there was also a tsunami. And just because of where that earthquake was, it was on the interface between the land and the ocean, so it shook both. So the sea floor off Kaikoura is really dramatic. We have this huge canyon, so we go from 30 meters water depth and we drop really quickly to a thousand meters. And the whole of the seascape on that margin, so not just the Kaikoura Canyon, but further ones as we go up towards Wellington and around, there are a whole series of these. They drop down and they feed into a channel that drops to anything from 2,000 to 5,000 meters. And this is where we're going to look at what happened on the seafloor. So what happened during the earthquake on the seafloor was first of all the intense shaking associated with the earthquake itself. And what this did to all the sediment that's kind of on the steep slopes, it started shaking and it started collapsing and falling down. We had submarine landslides falling down all of these canyons at the same time and they basically become these seething, broiling mass flows of sediment and water that was moving really fast. So it was kind of simultaneous carnage in these canyons. So because we can't go to the deepest part of the ocean to study these flows, which we call turbidity currents, um, we can actually create them in the laboratory in something a bit like a really large fish tank, and we call them flumes, that help us understand how they work in the real world. When the Kaikoura earthquake triggered these underwater avalanches, the flow that was moving along the seafloor we think was several hundred meters high and in places may have been up to 10 kilometers wide. So imagine 10 of these all forming at the same time, moving into the deeper part of the ocean and then all meeting up in this Hikarangi channel and then moving into the deep, deep part of, that, of the ocean there. So with the voyages that we've done since 2016, we've been able to actually trace how far that traveled. And incredibly, it traveled for 1,200 kilometers from the head of the Kaikoura Canyon out along this channel and all the way into something that we call um, the Hikarangi Channel Drift Deposit. So it starts off really huge, really energetic, and it just very gradually gets thinner slower, having dropped out sediment 
as it goes. So eventually it will run out of steam and stop. So how is it that we can actually investigate the seafloor? Well, Niwa has a research vessel called the RV Tangaroa. So what we have is what we call multi-beam, which is how we get our bathymetry, which is just a map of the ocean floor. And so that's how we can see where there are canyons and where there are channels. So we can see how things have changed because of the earthquake. So we have this map of the Kaikoura Canyon before the earthquake, and then afterwards you can see how much the seafloor has changed because of this large event. So once we've had a look at, at these maps and identified areas that we think might be really interesting, we can start to think about what we might want to learn from them. We've got a piece of kit called a multicorer, and it's got these little tubes in it that we send down to the seafloor, and then it will hit the seafloor, and then it will deploy the tubes into the sediment, and then we bring it all the way back up to the boat, and then we can pull it off the corer and start to look at the sediment from it. So a multi cora gives us multiple cores, as the name would suggest, and pick which cores we like the best. And for those cores, we will take what we call push cores. And essentially, we just take another tube and push it through the sediment to take a sub-core of that sediment. And we'll use that core to look at when we're in the lab. In the Kaikoura earthquake, um, turbidity currents were triggered in 10 consecutive canyons along the southern Hikurangi margin. And so we want to go look at what the event bed there looks like in all of these different canyons. We call it the event bed because it's linked to the 2016 earthquake. This is a core from the Hikurangi Channel. And um, so we've got the bottom here and then the top is up here. And we can see um, the Kaikoura event bed. So this was all deposited over a time period of probably like hours to days. And then up here, we've got the sediment that's been deposited since the earthquake. So this is from 2016 to 2019, and this is only a tiny fraction of the core. The base of the turbidite can be really erosional, so it's basically just wiping away what was there at the seafloor as it passed through, just destroying everything. So you can see it starts with like really sandy layers at the bottom. It takes a longer time for the finer sediments to settle out. Look, looks a lot calmer and a lot smoother and then we get all the way up to the top and you can see the seafloor as it is currently. So this is another core from the Hikurini Channel. It's um, a bit further along um, and to further down the system. So um, this is the top of the core, this is the bottom of the core and we can see it's a lot different from the other one. This is the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake up here. But then also, if we look down here, we have another very similar looking event bed that isn't from 2016. So we're trying to figure out exactly what earthquake that was, if it was indeed an earthquake. So it could have been from the 1855 Wairarapa earthquake or from the 1848 Marlborough earthquake. So if we were to drill a lot deeper, we would find many, many more um, past earthquakes or just other turbidites in general. Yeah, so I think there's actually loads of path, future pathways that we could go from with this. And one is, first of all, kind of to take a look to the ancient record, thinking about understanding past um, earthquakes and helping to predict the future earthquakes in and around New Zealand. And the other thing that we found that was really surprising was actually the influx of this event has kind of recharged the ecological system here. So we actually found that the event also brought food and nutrients into the deepest part of the ocean where there tends to not be all that much material for the little organisms and critters that live there to eat. And this was this basically ignited the system and got the ecology, all the little bugs going. And so this was actually a really unexpected result for us and it got the whole deep marine ecosystem of tiny organisms living again and thriving in this environment.